Just a little bit about me, if you're new to the area, I've been around here for a long time. I came here as a television news anchor and reporter, worked for Channel 7 for a while, and then worked for Bogus Basin. And while I was at Bogus, I wrote this crazy book about chickens. I grew up with chickens, so I always wanted them as an adult. And uh, I told my husband, I want, I want laying hens. And he'd always say, why do you want lame hens? <laughs> I want laying hens. <laughs> So when I, when I read an article in the New Yorker in 2000, oh, was it 2009 about people fighting for the right to have chickens in their backyards, it fascinated me. So I created a Google alert. Um, I'll explain what that is if some of you don't know what that is uh, later. But I created a Google alert. So every time urban chicken or backyard chicken hits the internet, it comes into my email box. So I've been following fights around the country ever since 2009, and it's still going on. People are still fighting for the right to have chickens in their backyard. So we here in Idaho are very fortunate. We're a chicken-loving state. We really are, except for in Burley. If you want chickens, don't live in the city of Burley. And there's a good reason for that. Um, they have a, a poultry processing plant there. And so, in terms of biosecurity, we'll also talk a little bit about biosecurity this morning. So, I'm going to try and zip through this really quickly so I don't take too much of your Saturday. <laughs> but what I want is to, to get you to the point where you can get a, you know, a, a handful of baby chicks here at D&B, go out the door, and you know exactly what to do, right? Isn't that what you want to know? Okay, so how many of you already have chickens? Thank you for coming. Oh, you can teach an old dog new tricks, right? I promise you'll learn something new here, right? Okay, I promise. Um, and then, how many of you have been to a chicken class before? Two. From like a competitor? Did you go to the library? Have you been at one of my classes before? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, just curious. Well, I'm glad you all are here. Thank you, thank you for coming. So, um, this also has a guide to keeping backyard chickens, my little book there, uh, and it's a great primer for just getting started. You can raise chickens just about anywhere. In Idaho, we have nice backyards most of the time, right? Um, in big cities like Chicago, Atlanta, New York, where they allow chickens, you'll find these kind of coops. It's a rooftop coop. Make sure you fence this back here, though, because <laughs> chickens really don't fly. You, you know that, right? And this right here, that's in Manhattan. Um, probably the most expensive coop in the country because it's an apartment in Manhattan. Uh, don't feed your chickens out of a dog, dog food dish and don't put newspaper down. The reason why is chickens poop. They, they do that all the time. They fertilize everything in their path. Okay, So you want to make sure that if they are roosting and they, they come down off the roost that they don't land in the poop, slide out and break a leg. Okay, So stay away from newspapers. Check your city county code. Okay, are you all from Boise? Meridian? Anyone else from any other place? Eagle? Nampa? Whoa! She doesn't even go here. <laughs> what movies? Ladies, you know what movie that's from, right? <laughs> cool. Well, you came all the way for that. Um, all right. So just make sure you know what your city allows, what your homeowners association allows. You know, I had to write this book and I had to have chickens, right? But my CCNRs say no poultry. And at one time I had 11 chickens running around my yard. So, shh, I got busted. I got busted several times. So, <laughs> anyhow, determine the number of chickens and chicks you uh, want. You know, how many, how many eggs are you going to eat? Are you going to share them? Are you going to barter with them? Are you going to sell your eggs? People do that all the time. I now buy some eggs from the little gal down, down the road who has a bunch of chickens and she can legally keep chickens. Um, and it helps her pay for the feed that she feeds her chickens. So uh, inform your neighbors and plan to share the eggs. I like cutting off a, a carton just you know for six and passing them over the fence. It makes for good neighbors, good neighbor relations. You know the number one misconception about having laying hands? There you go. Exactly. You know it. You don't need a rooster to get eggs. Your chickens will lay eggs regardless. But my mom, when I was a 12-year-old, didn't think that. So we had a rooster, right? <laughs> and, why, and, and in backyard chicken situations, um, the, the roosters are persona non grata because they crow all the time, right? And I, I asked my mentor, Mike Stanton, he's retired now, I said, why do they crow? Why, you know, why, 
why all the time, not just when the sun comes up? He says, well, they're marking their territory just like a dog. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You learn something new, right? Okay, so we keep chickens for pest control, nitrogen-rich fertilizer. I always make certain that um, I rest the chicken droppings before I ever put them in, in my garden. I throw them in the compost, right? Sustainability. Right now, our food mile from farm to fork is 1,500 miles. That's how far our food travels. So if you can walk out back and grab an egg out of your nest box and have it for breakfast, you're significantly reducing that food mile, right? Entertainment. <laughs> I guess I need to get out more because <laughs> my husband and I will take a glass of wine and sit on the back patio and watch the chicken. So notice I say chicken. I still I live in Eagle too, and I can't have chickens, but we I, I still have Hedwig, and my husband built me a chicken coop hiding in plain sight. So we'll talk about that because you may have something in your yard already that you could convert into a chicken coop, really easy. Um, and we do it for the egg production, just like that. Look at that. You're not going to find those in the market, right? And all those colored eggs, beautifully colored eggs. So. An egg that you get from your backyard chicken can be as dark brown as a Hershey chocolate bar. Dark, dark brown, the, the shell color. All the way to white, right? And green and blue and speckled in between. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the chickens that can lay those eggs here in a minute. The egg inside, all the same. They're all the same. There's been a lot of, you know, an urban uh, rumor, urban legend, that the brown eggs are healthier. That's not the case. Why, it, they're all the same, as long as you're getting them from a backyard. Um, if, you want, if you want egg producing chickens, make certain you purchase sexed chicks. DNB has what they call pullets, and those are sexed chicks. Now, is it a 100% guarantee that you're going to get a female? Not quite, but pretty close, about a 98% chance. Every once in a while, you'll get a little rooster who sneaks in there, OK? Um, terminology for you. The layers are the hens that lay an egg a day. They lay eggs every 24 to 26 hours, as long as they have 14 to 16 hours of sunlight, because that light, or, or other light, supplemental light, that light, supplement, or that light stimulates their ovulation process, and that's how you get the egg, right? So um, you want a layer. Setters are the ones who want to set on the eggs and hatch out babies. We call those mama wannabes. Probably the best app I've ever seen for chicken keepers, if you have a smartphone, and this isn't in the book, uh, is, is Mother Earth News. Full disclosure, I write for them. But their pick and chicken app, because it will tell you if it's a, if it's a layer uh, or a, a setter or a career gal, a chicken who wants to just lay the egg and then get out of there, right? Um, <laughs> And uh, it'll also tell you if it's a dual purpose, you can use them for laying and for meat purposes, that sort of thing. So it's a great app. Um, fryers are the, you know, the meat birds, right? And a lot of people are surprised to find out that the chickens that you see like on the spit at Winco or, or Costco, you know, the, the roasted chickens or the ones in the bag. Welcome, welcome. We've got goodies for you back there too, just in case you finish those. <laughs> Um, uh, the, you know, in the plastic bag, the fryers that you buy in the plastic bag, those chickens are anywhere from six to eight weeks old when they're butchered. They grow that fast. Yeah. Your laying hens will feather out at six to eight weeks. They'll finally be ready to go outside into the coop at six to eight weeks. And um, DNB here just had Cornish Cross, and th those are the meat birds, Cornish Cross. Anyone interested in meat birds? Okay, well, you've, you made it just in time. <laughs> okay, dual pro purpose, Cornish Cross. So the next time that they have Cornish Cross here is March 25th, 26th. Where are my glasses? 26th. Um, so you learned a little bit there. Um, a chick is a baby chicken that has not reached the age of laying, 20 to 24 weeks. So when you get your baby chicks, probably not today because we don't have any here, but the other DMBs have some chicks too. So if you grab your chicks, mark on the calendar today, and then go out five months, and that's when you should start looking for eggs. Okay, that's when you should ex expect <coughs> eggs. A pullet is a chicken that's not laying, but has not passed her first birthday. 
And then a hen is a, a year old chicken um, that will eventually experience a molt. And we'll talk about molting here in just a bit. There are 300, more than 300 recognized breeds of chickens. So the sky's the limit in terms of what kind of chickens you can get. If you want dark brown eggs, Barnevelder, Moran's, Rhode Island, Gold Sex Link, Welsomer. Um, and by the way, all of this is in my little book, The Backyard Chicken Fight. Uh, if you don't want to take notes and you want to dog ear the pages, okay? Um, and light brown, Brahma, Buff Orpington, Plymouth Rock, Black Sex Link, Wyandotte. Fun fact about the Moran, that's the one that lays the darkest colored egg, the dark, dark brown egg. Um, and you'll see them listed as cuckoo Morans, okay? Um, <laughs> white eggs, Buff Menorca, Golden Campine, Leghorn, not Leghorn, like Foghorn Leghorn. <laughs> They'll know you're a newbie if you say Leghorn, so Leghorn, <laughs> okay? Silver Log Lockenvelder and Salmon Favaral. I had a Silver Lockenvelder and I wrote about her, uh, Hank, the wayward Lockenvelder. Dumbest chicken I've ever had. <laughs> so if you, wanna, if you want a charity case, get a Lockenvelder, okay? Also, Salmon Favarals, fun fact about those guys. Um, most of your chickens, this is Henrietta, she's been around the block. See the three toes? A salmon Favarol has four. Totally grossed out my teenage daughters. <laughs> okay, if you want blue, green, or pink eggs, Americanas and Araconas are the chickens you're going to look for. They call them Easter Eggers sometimes. And now they're crossbreeding. They're crossbreeding an Araconna and a Moran. So a dark brown egg with a Moran, and they're getting these beautiful eggs that look like olives, you know, olive colored eggs. And so they call them olive eggers. So it, it, it just keeps changing and changing because I think people really dig the different colors. And let's talk about that right now. My, I always recommend that when you get your chicks, you get one of each breed because each breed will lay a different color egg and you can directly track your chicken's health through their egg production. All right? If Henrietta stops laying, you know something's up. She's either going into a molt or uh, she um, is being obstinate. <laughs> or Exactly. Yeah, you set the ax near the coop and you say, four days, girl. <laughs> four days. Um, or she's sick and you can address it that way. Okay? So you know, if you're not getting the olive egg, olive egg, eggs, olive colored eggs out of the coop, you know that something's going on, right? So, okay, Gretchen, what do I do when I walk out of D&B with these little babies that are just a, a day old? And most of the time they're just two or three days old when you get them. <clears throat> Here's the temperature guide. And each week you decrease it by five degrees, okay? Let me just talk about this picture. Girlfriend sent me this picture, would not keep my babies on uh, newspaper. I'll show you in a minute what I like best. But what I do like about this picture is that the food is both in the, the heat, under the heat lamp, and outside the heat lamp. And they've made, it, made a mess of it right there, right? So you need to elevate that food. Even for your chicks, you have to elevate the food, right? We'll talk about that. Um, and then all of it. And if you have questions, hold it because I'll probably answer it through this. And then the water outside the heat. Here's the deal. Let your chicks talk to you. So if you have a heat lamp with your babies, okay, and a brooder box, I use a cardboard box or a Sterilite container or anything I have in my, my uh, garage. I put the, the heat lamp on them. And if they're all bunched up under the heat lamp, what does that tell you? It's too cold. Right. So you need to lower that heat lamp. If they're like way far out, you're going to fry your chicks, right? <laughs> so you got to bring it up a little bit. So unless you want to put a thermometer right on the box at chick height, okay, which you can do. But I, le I let the chicks talk to me. That's the easiest way to do it. And I'm a self-confessed uh, lazy chicken keeper. So <laughs> I'm going to show you the secrets to, you know, just getting right in there and getting it done and no fuss, no muss to make it easy on you. So there's that Sterilite container, right? And I took an old Amazon box, made it a loft. <laughs> there's the food under the light. You can see the light there. I made a little roost out of a, a yardstick, and here's the water over here. See that little face right there? So cute. I think that's Thelma and Louise. Um, 
Yeah, Thelma and Louise. <laughs> I, my kids named them. Um, so they have plenty of room here. I, te I start teaching them how to roost at two weeks. Okay, when they're two weeks, when I've had them for two weeks, I start putting them on the little roost so they get used to it. Um, so anything, can, you can brood your chicks anywhere in anything. Just keep them warm enough, okay? And you brood them until they're feathered out, and that's usually six to eight weeks. Does that help? Okay. So, yeah, Thelma and Louise, sex links. Um, I had a friend say, why do they call them sex links? What a name. I said, well, the reason is, is when they hatch out, they're a hybrid chicken. Um, they're crossbreed. And when they hatch out, you know which are the females and which are the males because their feather colors are linked to their gender. So that's why they call them sex links. And they're great chickens, great egg layers, and uh, really nice chickens. So if you get a black sex link and a gold sex link, you're, you're rocking it, okay? This is, I like these pellets right here for um, chick bedding. The chicks can't eat it. Uh, they really can't scratch it into the food or the, the water. And then I clean it up with a cat, um, a little cat, what do you call those, cat spoons or? Yeah, yeah. And they break down, they're non-toxic, so I put them in the, the compost later. I'll pass that around. How long do you do that? You know, that's a good question. And so let's visit that. The question was, how often do you clean out that little brooder box? You all are going to have brooder boxes that are different sizes, right? Yeah. So you look in there, if there's lots of poop in there, clean it out. If it smells bad, clean it out. It's, it's, it's judgment. You, you know, don't let them run around in their own poop a lot because they'll get sick mm -hmm. that way, okay? Um, no corn cob bedding, no ground corn cob bedding. Chickens have a crop. Those of you who have chickens, you know there's this bulgy thing on their chest right here. You pick them up and you love on your chickens and you can feel this little bulgy thing. So it's right here. And what they do is they ingest their food. It goes down in and it goes to the crop. And if they do that with corn cob, ground corn cob, it doesn't break down. And they'll have an impacted crop and die. So stay away from that. Sometimes you see it because it is made of, it's, it's a popular bedding. Okay, here come the feed guidelines. So when you walk out of the store, what do you need? Zero to eight weeks, chick starter. You'll find this here at DMB. And um, it has added protein for growth. So zero to eight weeks. If you still have some at 10 weeks, don't sweat it. Okay, keep feeding them until it's gone. And then switch to what they call a, um, a pullet developer, or I think there's another name for it. Jen, do you know the name of the, there, it's a, it's a lower protein. It's in between the chick starter and the lay pellets. There's a feed that you, you give your chickens. I've always called it pullet developer, but I think there's another name for it here. It's just a little less expensive, so it's a good thing. Um, sometimes you'll see chick starter that is medicated. And the only time I recommend medicated chick starter, you know, with the pre-medication pre so that we can keep them healthy, is if you have a lot of chicks, okay? A lot, I'd say 10 or more. If you have 10 or more chicks, because if one chick gets sick, it's likely that all of them are gonna get sick. And that's a pretty good investment in little chicks already. So that's, that's the only time I would do the medicated stuff. There's the pullet developer, less protein, eight to 24 weeks, and 24 weeks is that magic number where they start laying eggs. And that's when you have to put them on lay pellets. 16%, I know, aren't they cute? Girlfriend, those dogs don't even look like you. What are you thinking? I, I honestly, I have a, an Americana, and uh, she, she's white. She's a creamy white. And then I breed Bichon Frises, and they're little white dogs. <laughs> Hardy little white dogs who think they're actually big dogs. And, uh, and I, think, I think Hedwig just thinks she's a dog. She <laughs> hangs out with them all the time. Um, and then in the wintertime, switch to 20% protein in lay pellets. The wonderful thing about DMB, if you come in here and you have questions and you can't remember 16, 20%, what am, you know, what am I supposed to do? I know I'm supposed to bump up the protein in the wintertime. They'll help you, okay? That's the nice thing. Um, chickens will drop their feathers once a year. Um, once they get to about 12 months old, they will stop laying eggs. And that's why it's nice to have a, a chicken, you know, where you know her color egg, right? 
And then you can start looking for feathers. And if you don't see feathers, then there's something else going on with her. So um, don't be alarmed. And it can happen anywhere on her body. Hedwig uh, molted, had a full-on molt right before a big party we were giving for my mother-in-law. In the backyard, looked like we killed a chicken. <laughs> feathers everywhere. <laughs> and in October, and I'm thinking, girl, it's getting cold at night. <laughs> you know, what are you thinking? Can't you do this in July? <laughs> So you can also feed them treats. Cracked corn, and remember this, cracked corn really only for winter and only if you want to bribe your chickens, okay? <laughs> the reason I say that is cracked corn, when you feed them cracked corn, it elevates their body temperature. And chickens actually can fare better in the wintertime than they do in the summertime. So give them a little bit of cracked corn before they go to bed at night in the wintertime. You'll get an egg the next day. I've proven it. Because what that does is you fill up their crop. And they sit on the roost, and they burn that all night long. And then you get an egg the next day. And I learned that from a, from a person who attended one of my classes. They said, try it. And sure enough, it was great. So cracked corn, hen scratch. Hen scratch has some white wheat in it and some milo. Um, it, it's mixed with other grains as well. And they like that just as much. And then kitchen scraps. My husband runs restaurants. He runs steak restaurants. And uh, he was in, I want to say, the Nampa restaurant. And there was this old farmer. And um, he asked for a to-go box. And my husband was just making small talk. And he said, oh, you're going to take that home and have it for lunch tomorrow? And he said, no, I'm taking it home, cutting it up, and feeding it to my chickens. They'll eat anything that won't eat them first. <laughs> so it's true. They'll eat any, and you know, your compost is like fair game, right? So. Anything you put in your compost bucket to take out to the composter, check it out and say, oh, okay, you know, Head would, head would, would eat that and she'd eat that. And I've just found that I have to cut it up for her. Don't offer your hands these things. Raw green potato peels because they contain solanine. That's not good for them or you, or you and me. It's not good. Any foods with high salt content, dried or undercooked beans, avocado skin of pit, citrus, though this is still being debated because in the warmer climates, like in New Mexico, Arizona, California, Texas, you have feral chickens, wild chickens. And uh, I'm sure that they eat citrus. You know, they're probably very healthy for it too. Don't feed your chickens raw eggs because you don't want them to get the taste of it, right? You don't want them to lay an egg and then turn around and go, ooh, <laughs> yum. And because what happens is they do that and then you can't stop them from doing that, okay? And they'll just eat the whole dang thing, shell and all. Yeah, if you let them do that. So that's why. I always recommend um, timely egg gathering too. Don't let your eggs just set in the box. Also, no candy, chocolate, or sugar, because it'll rot their teeth. <laughs> right, thank you. My attempt at humor. Chickens don't have teeth. They don't have teeth. But, but, but their DNA is the closest to dinosaurs. So that's why when I got Bravo Company, that was my second group of chickens, my kids named them all dinosaur names. So, um, yeah, they don't have teeth. They have little barbs on their tongue and they ingest their food and then it goes down into the crop and they use grit, oyster shell, whatever they have in there to help digest it and some enzymes of their own making. And then it goes, do you know where it goes next? How many of you are fond of eating gizzards? Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's where it goes next. So sometimes you gotta clean out those gizzards because sometimes the, that grit makes it into the gizzards. And then it goes through the intestinal tract, yes. Good question. She asked, when do you usually start giving them the grit? Here's the thing. If you're feeding them a quality manufactured food, which of course you can get here at DMB, um, they should be able to pick up a lot of sand and rock and dirt in your yard. But if you notice that uh, they're having a difficult time digesting, you just put a little grit, and I have some up here, in a rabbit feeder, just like this. Okay? Put it in here and just hang it inside the coop. And then they have grit available to them. Grit's really cheap, and so is oyster shell. Oyster shell is giving them added calcium, okay? And that makes their uh, eggs, their eggshells a little bit harder, okay? If you notice that the eggshells are really soft, give them a little more calcium. But I think if you're feeding them a quality manufactured food, they should get all the calcium that they need. The other thing you have to consider is when you're feeding them the food that you purchase, and then you free range them in your yard, 
that's going to dilute the protein that they're getting from the, the uh, manufactured food unless they're going hog wild on the spiders and worms and bugs, right? High in protein. So it's all kind of like this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're getting about 16%. Pretty sure. Um, yeah, garden season is upon us. Although, aren't you waiting for the other shoe to drop? It's going to freeze here <laughs> soon. Um, let's just go real quickly. This is what I have. This is not my garden, but I, this is the kind of setup I have where I just get some green fencing and bamboo stakes and I put fencing all around my gardens, even with just one chicken, because she will make a salad, mincemeat, out of my, uh, anything, anything new. The tender greens, she's all over it, so I have to keep her out. And this does the job. And it's like, I think it's, I wanted to just say I bought four feet and I actually cut it in half, so it's just two feet. And she doesn't fly over it. She's not that smart. <laughs> I think she's smart, but she's not that smart. Or you can do something really elaborate like that. The water can get in, the sun can get in, but the chickens can't. Or something mega, a chicken moat. Woo! See, they just travel all around. The garden's in here. The chickens are in here. Here's the idea. There's the hen house. And they do this. And they act as sentries to all the bugs and icky things that want to get in the garden, right? Isn't that awesome? And look, the chicken underpass. <laughs> they call it a channel, a chicken underpass, chicken tunnel. Yeah, I thought that was fantastic. That's if you have a big garden and, you know, and it's a good way to keep your chickens. So cooping's the biggest thing you'll do for your hens, okay? At six to eight weeks, which you have plenty of time now to get your baby chicks now and brood them and then figure out your, your um, cooping situation, I always recommend build the largest coop and the largest run that you can. You won't be sorry that, you, that you're that you able to, affordability-wise and handyman-wise, okay? Because then you can just load up the food and the water and you can go away for a couple days, right? So, how much space? Remember these numbers. One chicken, four square feet in the coop, okay? One chicken, eight square feet in the run. The anatomy of the coop, this is the coop part right here. This is the run. And this run, this was my first coop. And it's, um, they say that you can have five to eight birds in this. Mm -mm, really small. Although I did have 11 in there at one time. <laughs> but they free range in the yard, right? They just cozy up on the inside and they would free range during the day. And as you'll notice, you can kind of see some daylight right through there. I've got a big window here, there's a door right there and a walk up right there. And then under this corrugated roof, um, there's an air channel as well. Ventilation in your coop is more important than insulation, okay? You got to keep them out of the wind, but you want it ventilated. You never want to go in your coop and smell any ammonia smell or have it be humid especially in the winter time, because what will happen in the winter time is that humidity will attach itself to the, the, um, the combs and the wattles, those things that hang down here, these little guys right here, and the toes, and that's when your chickens get frostbite, okay? I teach a wintering hens class because a lot of people freak out. Oh, it's winter, what am I gonna do with my girls? I gotta bring them inside. Um, you don't need to do that. They actually do all right, but there's a couple things you need to learn about, and so. Is that ideal for what, two or three then? If you were always keeping them in this run, exactly. He asked if it's ideal for two or three hens. And at one point when I got busted, I, I rehomed all my girls and then everybody, the kids missed the chickens. I missed the chickens, my husband missed the chickens. We all grew very fond of them. So we moved this to the other side of the property and got them back. And I only kept three because we just kept them in there so that they wouldn't cause a problem. And then I got busted again, so. So I got rid of that, and then uh, for Mother's Day, I said, I want a, I want a coop hiding in plain sight, and we did it. And I'll, I'll pass around a picture of it here in just a sec. So, so four and eight, right? Four square feet inside, eight square feet in the run, if that's where you're keeping your chickens. Uh, nesting boxes, again, one nest box per four chickens. I taught a class out in, um, at Lizard Butte Library, you know, way out. <clears throat> Do y'all know where that is? It's way out. It's out on Sunny Slope. So they called, they said, can you come teach a class? I said, yeah, where, where are you? 
Lizard Butte. It's uh, out by the wineries. Um, yeah, it's pretty out there. And one guy had just built his, his coop and he put in 12 nest boxes for all 12 chickens. And I thought, oh, you're so thoughtful. <laughs> he was. I mean, that's so thoughtful of a guy to do that. But really, your girls and those of you who have chickens will say, uh-huh, exactly. You'll have four nest boxes. They'll prefer one nest box. They'll always go to one nest box. And if one is in it, they'll, one will waddle up the stairs and look at her and go, bark, 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 bark. like, get the hell out of there. <laughs> I'm ready to lay my egg. And so sometimes you'll find both chick two chickens in one nest box. I can talk chicken. I had chickens. <laughs> really, I mean, it was the 70s. There wasn't anything on TV, so I was, I was in talking to the chickens. Um, so let's see, run size, proximity to neighbors. Uh, whenever I do a site visit, and I do, I do a lot of them where I'll go out and people will say, where, where should I put my coop? First thing I say is don't put it anywhere it's going to be sprinkled, like watered, okay? That's really important. And then which side are your nicest neighbors? You know, that's the better thing to do because we moved it over to the nice neighbor who likes taking care of chickens. So, um, and, and try to keep it away from them a little bit if you can. And, all, and I like putting mine in a northern area where it's more shaded. Again, chickens can withstand cool temperatures better than our heat, you know, our crazy heat, right? Bedding. I was, what do I put on the ground? What do I put in their coop? I like straw. It's cheap. I like pine shavings. It's cheap and goes a long way. The thing about pine shavings, I think they, they meld better into the garden. I can put them into my composter and they just work better in my garden. So I go both on both. In the summertime with this one, what we used to do is mow the lawn and I would put grass, grass clippings in there. But here's the deal. And thankfully, um, DMB has natural products here. If, you're, if you have a lawn program and you're putting stuff on your lawn, make sure whatever you put on your lawn is natural. Okay? Because your chickens are going to ingest everything that's out there if you free range your girls. Right? Just a real quick story. The reason why I say this is in 2010, Backyard Chickens got a black eye because some uh, kids got sick in Salt Lake. The little girls ended up in the hospital with high levels of arsenic in their, in their urine. And the parents tested positive for it as well. And um, they found out that it was coming, coming from the chickens. And the, and the parents couldn't figure out how it happened. And then finally it was discovered that the, the dude, the father, um, picked up some ironite from like Lowe's or Home Depot to green up his lawn, right? That's what you use it for. Most ironite product comes from the Superfund cleanup sites. That's a byproduct from the Superfund cleanup sites. And, and that's mining, mining sites. And what do they use in mining? Arsenic. Yeah, arsenic. So, so that really hits at home. Be aware, if you are going to free range your girls, be aware of what you're putting in your yard. So we're all going to have different numbers of chickens, right? And we're all going to have different sizes of coops. So I always say if you stick your head in and it smells worth it worse inside than it does outside, it's time to clean your coop. Easy. Rule, easy rule of thumb. Okay, I think we covered that. Be creative with your ideas for chicken coops. Yeah, do you, all, do you know what that is? Do you all know what that is? Can you tell? It's a bathroom vanity. It's an old upside down bathroom vanity. So this would be the, the top part up here, right there. That drawer was just turned, you know, turned right. So he did it upside down. He, he put these faces on, took the drawers out and just used the faces, glued them down. This guy was on the coop tour four or five years ago in, here in Boise, up on Cole Road. That's a barred rock chicken. And he has two of them and they live in there. And he just pushes that drawer in, the girls go in, lay their eggs, and that's where they spend their evenings, shutter. right in there. And don't you love the shutter? I, I think the shutter's great. He said he got this stuff back at St. Vincent de Paul, you know, on State Street, where you go in the back mm -hmm. and you pay five bucks for stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so be creative. You, you, you know, the sky's the limit. You're only limited by your imagination. Um, these guys are great. <laughs> yeah, the flockers, population four. Don't you love that? Um, the Benyons, 
they're so cute. They, uh, they had a dog and then they didn't, he died of old age and they wanted chickens and they went through a fight in Iowa and they had to fight for the right to keep chickens. And so RD built this um, chicken tractor and the idea is you pull up these <laughs> stabilization jacks, <laughs> isn't that great? Look at the, and the little lamp too, I just love it. And everything's hanging here, so it's real easy. So the girls go in here at night. You don't ever have to corral your girls and put them to bed. The old saying, chicken comes home to roost, they do that because it's a survival instinct. So they're going to um, go in at night all by themselves. And so they pull up the stakes and they move it one length down. And so that part of the lawn benefits from their aeration, right? The chicken's aerating it fertilizing it, and then they get any kind of bugs that are there as well. You just have to remember to move it every day, right? And there's a new company here in Boise that is um, letting you try before you buy, and they have chicken tractors and chickens that they're renting this summer. Wow. Yeah, cool, huh? Channel 7 did a story on them, and we, I, I talked about it a little bit. So that's a really fancy chicken tractor. This is a really simple one. And you'll see these sometimes. These are not cold hardy, okay? We couldn't have these in, in Boise. That it, it, it's just not warm enough. But Landsake Farms in Western Massachusetts, they're kind of like um, the Idaho Botanical Garden. And they rent chickens. So they'll put in two um, Buff Orpingtons. These, I'm, I want to say they're Dominiques, but Buff Orpingtons are the big yellow chickens kind of waddle like this and they get really big and they're really docile so if you have kids little kids an Orpington is a good chicken to have because they're very friendly sometimes they can get broody though they'll want to set on some eggs anyway they deliver this contraption the water the feeder the all the food and two hens to a backyard and a fenced backyard and then the person writes the check and they're off right and the idea is you, you keep them here for a day, you pick up this end and this end, pick it up when they're inside, and you move it either one length down or one width over, right? And then at the end of the month, when they go to pick up the chickens, because they've had them for a month, they, they go to the pit and they get in their pickup and they drive over to the house and there's mom, she's loving the chickens, the kids have them like this because they're so <laughs> friendly and dad's just writing another check. So. <laughs> They said it's a great program, it's a great program. Okay, a coop with a cool factors. Just some ideas for you. I taught, um, my husband and I actually taught uh, art in the Meridian School District. They don't have any art specialists for the grade schools. So for 12 years, we were art parents. And when I saw this coop, I said, uh, um, who is it? The, and, no, I'm thinking Andrew Lloyd Webber, that's the musician, right? Frank Lloyd, Frank Lloyd Wright, thank you. <laughs> I'm my, I've got allergies big time, and so I, the words don't come to me. Frank Lloyd Wright. Doesn't look like Frank Lloyd Wright there. The design, well, it's actually an architect uh, uh, fellow in Portland, Oregon, and he said all of the materials he used was from, uh, left over from a kitchen remodel. And he has a garden on top. Oh Isn't that nice? Yeah. And then the girls go out here, and he says sometimes he'll let them free range if he's home but they're happy chickens. I'm uh, chicken sitting for a lady in the North End, and I just went over to her place yesterday. And this is the, the setup that they have, and I loved it. She did everything right. I gave her a book. I said, you get a gold star, <laughs> because um, she has plenty of ventilation here. She has a little run off of this side right here, and then she thought, I want to give them some more room. So she fashioned a little door over here and the girls can walk over there and then she calls this the channel here. And then they just go there and then back into that area too. So they have a contained area where they can just go hog wild on, on scratching and pecking and all that stuff. So if you want to contain your girls because God is my witness, my husband did not like the fact that the chickens would poop everywhere on the hot tub, on the patio furniture, on the patio, everywhere. And if it was in the sun for any length of time in the summertime, mm, <laughs> gnarly, it was awful. So there's another picture of, of the channel. And these you just pick up and move. But she, they're going to redo their lawn 
and she wanted to keep them contained. And I thought that was such a great idea. And, and now you can kind of see the, the area. Yeah, so here's the other thing. We had a coop in our backyard the whole time. Remember these Costco play centers? I'm sure y'all have seen them. We've got the swings and the slide and the little area where you do the sandbox. My husband enclosed the bottom part of the sandbox. <laughs> yeah, and then if you go around the back, you flip open the door, there's the roost, the food, the laying, the nest box, etc., etc. I'll pass that around so you can take a look at it. So look in your yard, your own yard, and see if you have something, because you may very well have something that's not being used. Our kids were, you know, 12 and older at that point, and they weren't using it anymore. Um, but it, uh, it, no one knows it's a chicken coop, so it's pretty cool. So when you're getting your your coops. <clears throat> In our climate, they need to have a wide roost, the girls, in the wintertime. And the reason I say that is that you want the girls to jump up and just say, Gretchen, how high do I need to put the roost? About 18 inches, depending on your birds, 12 to 18 inches up from the floor, depending on where your floor is. And then you can go with another one even higher. The chickens like to go up high because, again, it's a survival instinct. They like to roost on the highest part because they think that predators won't get them that way. Make sense? So if you have big birds, like an Orpington uh, or a Brahma, those are big chickens. You may want to lower it just a little bit, OK? Because those big girls can't jump up the 18 inches. So put it down to about 12. So the, the two by four oriented on the four side, what you want them to do is jump up on the, up on the roost, splay out their toes, and bring their feathers down over their toes in the wintertime. You don't want this sort of thing. Okay, on a round dowel or something like that, because they'll bring their feathers, and, and this much will be showing. You'll have a little humidity; it'll attach to those toes, and you'll have frostbitten toes in the winter time. Okay, so two by four is the best. I do not recommend heat lamps, not not at all. And I say, Gretchen, practice what you preach. And I have one chicken, and you know what? I would never recommend that. But there are some extenuating circumstances with Hedwig. Um, <laughs> She's a pet, and she'll live out a nice, long life. Um, uh, and she's just one bird. And usually these birds kind of buddy up and keep each other warm, right? She's one. I don't heat her coop. And you know how cold it got this winter, right? And last winter, she's fine. I don't heat them. Also, you see wild birds all the time r flying around, right? They're fine. You just have to watch out for their combs, their waddles, and their toes. I love these water fonts, and you can, you can use all sorts of things. Maybe some of you have heard about the, the water nipples that you can put into buckets, and your chickens actually drink kind of like a hamster would. They make those, and lots of people like that. I'm a fan of, of the old-fashioned galvanized water font, and I like this size. I had a five-gallon one at one time, and it was very heavy once you fill it up. So it just... Un and does like that, and then you fill it up in there, and you keep it clean, and this will last you a lifetime if you take good care of it, okay? The one thing that you want to do is say, we're all the chickens, and Henrietta is our smallest hen. You want to elevate your feed and your water to the height of the back of the smallest chicken. Does that make sense? So we're all bigger chickens, right? She can get it now, and the rest of us can get it right? That way, chickens, the, the Latin name for chickens is gallinaceous. That means scratchers of the earth. And um, they'll scratch all sorts of crap into the water. And if you can elevate it to the height of the smallest chicken's back, then they're not going to scratch that stuff in. Make sense? That's less work for you. Trust me, you don't want to be cleaning it out all the time. The other type of feeder I really like, and there's lots of different ideas out there, is this type of feeder. It has the tines, so your chicken can't get in there and go, you know, go tick, 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 and, and waste your feed and cost you more money. I'm also a frugal chicken keeper, right? So uh, a gravity feeder, it's a fancy name for putting the food up in here <laughs> and having the food come, just come down. Don't mix anything with your food. You have quality manufactured food, 
Some people will tell you, oh, put a little bit of, you know, corn or scratch grains in there. Don't do that. Just plain food in this, okay? Um, and those two things come from D and B. So let's talk about wintertime just briefly, if you don't make it to one of my winter classes. I made a homemade water he heater out of a, a popcorn tin. Got to get the real tall ones, okay? And I took a, I don't think I explained it here. There's explanation in the book. But I took a, a brick, set it in the bottom. I took one of those trouble lights that you have for the garage, you know? Um, what do you call them? Are they trouble light? Is that what you call them? Put a 40 watt or even a 25 watt is what I start with. 25 watt bulb in there, stick it in there. Condescent bulb, the ones that heat up a little bit, right? Put that in there. I do a, a V-clip on the, on the can so that the wire can go through, put the lid back on, and then I set the water on top of it. What you don't see up here is that I bungee, I took the bungee, a bungee cord and secured it through here and secured it on the, on the coop. So that'll save you some money because water heaters are a little expensive. And I'll tell you, chickens aren't smart enough to break through the ice and get a drink. And water is your number one nutrient for chickens, okay? Fresh, clean water, number one nutrient. They can go without food for a while, but not good, clean water, okay? Um, feeder, same thing, I just showed you. Love this. Although, Hank, the wayward Lockenvelder, right there, she would roost right here and poop into, that's paint, by the way. We painted the house that year, <laughs> I promise, and it's still there. Um, she'd poop into this, and I, oh man, I either have to move the feeder or I gotta figure something out. Cheap and easy solution. The cake top at Costco, you know those big <laughs> chocolate cakes? Rock on, we had our solution. You know, um, these have either a pin or a little thing. You could just take, put a slice in that cake top and you'd be good to go, right? Okay. Um, cooper free range. A lot of control in cooping and keeping them in a, in a, a run. But if you want to free range them and have the entertainment and watch them in your yard, that's a wonderful thing as well, but you got to clean up the poop. So. It's all up to you. The one thing I always say though is if you free range them in the summertime, free range them in the wintertime. Let them out in the wintertime. They'll make the decision as to whether they want to go out in the snow or not. Okay. Um, if you're free rangers, the, the lady I just visited yesterday, she said, yeah, the girl's wings are clipped. And I said, both? She said, yeah, really short. So it's a misnomer when they say clip their wings. It's only one wing you want to clip. Okay, if you want to keep them from flying over the fence. And, and Hank the Wayward Lockenvelder used to be on the fence, on the roof, <laughs> up in the tree. So I, I clipped her pretty quickly after. We had to do a search party every night when we'd go close up the chicken coop. So you want to just clip one wing that just throws them off when they want to fly. Okay, it throws them off balance. Otherwise, and there's great information in that little book there. So, this is the main reason why we keep the chickens. Here's the, the meat and potatoes of, of why it's so good to keep backyard chickens. Those are the uh, Moran's eggs. Aren't they beautiful? And those are the olive eggers. I want one of those chickens. Um, aren't they beautiful? You just wouldn't find these at the market. Oh, and by the way, okay, two things. Yeah, could you imagine handing those across the fence to your neighbors? Here, make some eggs. <laughs> they go, oh my God, what, what do you mean? <laughs> no way. So I was teaching a class out in Caldwell, and one of the ladies in the very back said, when you share your eggs, make sure you tell them what to expect. I hope that all of you have had nice fresh eggs, right? Yes? Okay, so you know that a fresh egg just out of the backyard coop is beautiful orange. The yolk and the, and the whites have more integrity. You know, they kind of sit up and say hi and that sort of thing. And ones from the market just don't do that. So um, make sure you tell them that that's going to happen. This lady said, I shared a dozen eggs with my neighbors in the backyard and they threw them out after they, op uh, after they cracked them open because they thought they were bad. Yeah, I know. Uh, Bummer. So here's what you're going to be talking about around the water cooler on Monday when, you, when your friends say, what? You're going to get chickens? Why? Well, first you can tell them about the food mile, 1,500 miles, right? And now you can tell them that Mother Earth News 
And Tufts University did a study a while back, and they found they, they compared market eggs with backyard chicken eggs. And they took backyard chicken eggs from several different places in the country. They found one third less cholesterol in the backyard chicken eggs. And of the cholesterol that it had in it, there was a higher level of HDL, which is the good for you cholesterol, right? Twice as many omega-3 fatty acids, seven times more beta carotene, one third more vitamin A, talk about a superfood, and three times more vitamin E. By the way, here's some other fun facts. The egg is the one animal protein that our human bodies best assimilate. We break it down the best, as opposed to like a steak or fish or something like that. And the egg, the protein in the egg, is the protein by which other proteins are measured. It's the baseline. Eggs, yeah, cool. One other thing, our federal government says eggs that you get from the market are fresh 45 days after packaging. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so when I started this whole thing, I wanted to, to find out what, um, what the eggs were like that are marked cage-free, organic, because we had never bought those. They were very expensive. And so um, we would go to Costco and buy you know, five dozen eggs at a time. Five kids. They eat a lot of food. And sometimes 10 dozen at a time. I mean, that's, and, and, and breakfast is a huge thing in our family. And so I went down to Albertsons paid him five bucks for a dozen eggs <laughs> and came home and I cracked my backyard egg and I cracked one of those organic cage-free chicken eggs and that's what I got. Yeah, that egg right there, my friends, didn't look or taste any different than those eggs that we were buying five dozen at a time. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what you can expect with the fresh eggs. Um, it really makes me wonder what we're, the marketing we're getting fed, you know, on cage-free and organic. Huge difference, huge, huge difference. So, some of our first eggs, woo, watch out for these. Don't be alarmed. When your girls start laying, it's gonna, they're going to look different. Don't worry, it's kind of blurry, sorry about that. Keep your nest box, boxes clean. I put in decoy eggs. They always crack these open, <laughs> this one open. Um, but that's looking into the nest box. You want to keep the nest box clean and you want to keep their vent clean. This is where all the party happens, right? <laughs> so it's really important. Two things I always say. One, you got to have your girls roost, okay? Because they'll roost and they'll poop. And that's why they call them droppings. They drop, okay? If you go in at night and you're closing your girls up, who, you have chickens? Do they hang out in the nest boxes sometimes? No, oh, good, you have good chickens. Some of you who have chickens may experience this. They get cozy in the nest box and they go, oh, this is so nice. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to poop all night long. It's going to back up on my tail feathers. <laughs> Don't let them do that because it will. It'll get all icky here, okay? And then you have to give your chicken a bath. Seriously. <laughs> They like it, they do. Or you can do what I did, I peep, the curious. Um, I grabbed her like this, and I put her butt right here, her head was going that way, and I took some scissors and I just went ah, job done, I don't have to give you a bath. And then the next day I went out and she had gone into a full on molt. I want a coop where I can walk in. Um, and I would do washable nest boxes, really cheap. Bucket, quarter lid, little walk up, she's good to go. How big should the nest box be? The girls should be able to turn around in them. All of us are going to have different sized chickens. Good luck with the bantams, folks. <laughs> eggs are like this. I was like, I'll have half a dozen eggs for breakfast, thank you. Um, and this is a hooded cat box, you can find them here. Great nesting box. And then I love this, this is from Ikea. I think it's a brilliant idea. She cut out these two drawers and put tape. So these are the nest boxes for the girls. These are all her supplies. The girls, the chickens, kind of hang out up here, roost up here, and they poop into this. And she takes that drawer and right in her, yeah, right in her compost. I thought, oh, there it is. Once I get my coop that I can walk into, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Smart stuff. Um, Fresh from your coop, unwashed, non-fertilized eggs do not need to be refrigerated. 
don't wash them as long as they're unfertilized because what happens is when they're laid uh, there's a protein that goes on the egg that's called the bloom and it just protects the egg it can sit on your counter for two weeks without any sign of deterioration I mean I've been to Mexico <laughs> Yeah, and they're the, egg, the eggs are all sitting out there right next to the pig that's hanging out and flies. And, yeah. Anyway, I, I, was all, I always wanted to say, shouldn't all of that be in the refrigerator? But the eggs don't have to be in the refrigerator. Um, so nature's way. The States is one of the only places where mm -hmm. people actually refrigerate their eggs. Almost everybody else does not. Okay. So Singapore, my sister was there. They, they don't refrigerate their eggs, yeah. yeah. Um, this young lady just said, the United States is one of the only places that refrigerates its eggs. Yeah, yeah. Because the ones you buy at the market, the, the bloom has been washed off of those. And so you, you have, there, there's nothing protecting it, so you should put them in the fridge. Yeah, so don't be, uh, don't mistake that. <laughs> also, I used to think too, a double yoker, oh, twins, no. <laughs> I grew up on fertilized eggs, Casanova, our rooster, you know, and you can see, you can see the opaque disc on a, on a, a yolk, and that's what turns into the chick, and the yolk and the whites are just feed and fuel for the ch developing chick, right? Um, chicken biology, remember the vent where all the party happens? Okay, this is where all the icky stuff comes out, and, and it's closed off when all the eggs are here. And then when an egg is laid, yay, all of this is closed off and the egg comes out sanitary. So it's really important to keep those tail feathers clean and the box clean. If you get any muck on, on the eggs at all, don't wash them. Just take a stiff bristled brush or even sandpaper and just get them cleaned off or just hide them. When my sister comes over, I don't, <laughs> I don't let her see me crack the eggs. So no, Hedwig's, Hedwig's backside's pretty clean. Um, the red jungle fowl is what all of our chickens descended from. And they were bred over years and by scientists and farmers to lay eggs every day, every 24 to 26 hours. And then they take, you know, they take a day off here and there. We've talked about the combs, the earlobes, combs, and wattles. Oh my. These are the wattles, just for those in the back who didn't see that, and combs. And you have single combed girls. You can have a pea comb, a rose comb. The girls who have the pea combs and rose combs, the combs that are closer to their head, instead of the one single one, fare better in the winter time in terms of frostbite. Fun fact, you can tell a chicken's uh, color of her egg by her ear color. If it's white and light colored here, it's gonna be white. If it's dark at all, it's gonna be a, a brown, some kind of brown egg. The only ones you can't do that with are the Americanas and the Araconas. The colored eggs. Okay, let's talk about biosecurity for just a minute. <clears throat> We've had a case of avian flu here in the Treasure Valley. Um, if some of you didn't know about it, what it is is it's a highly pathogenic, meaning it'll kill you right there, and it's very susceptible, or um, they can share it. Uh, influenza that can wipe out flocks fast. So um, the the carriers of this influenza are the wild uh, birds that fly this Pacific flyway, okay? Mainly ducks, any kind of ducks, wild ducks. And they just carry it, they're vectors is what they call them. They don't die from it, they just carry it. So if you have an area where there's a pond in your yard or something like that, and you know ducks are there, you can't have your chickens commingle. You can't even have them in the same area because those, those ducks carry that disease and we'll pass it on to your chickens, okay? One other thing, if you live in a place like I do where you walk around and there's some ponds and you know, walking paths and that sort of thing and there's duck poop, mm -hmm. you don't take those shoes and walk in your backyard where your chickens are going to be. I always recommend to have one pair of chicken shoes and I have a chicken coat as well for the winter time and those just stay in one place, okay? Does that make sense to y'all? Okay, let's stop the spread of this because it's brand new in, in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah? Is it just ducks or is it geese? Um, some geese can carry it according to our state veterinarian, but mainly ducks. Okay. Um, what do you do if you get bugs? And here's the deal. You'll keep a clean, clean coop, right? 
but you'll still get mites or lice with your chickens and you just have to watch that. Um, when I was a kid, we got mites. I remember picking up the chickens and letting them down and I had little pink bugs all over my hands. <laughs> you know, freak me out. Nice thing is, is that the chicken's temperature, body temperature, is about eight degrees higher than ours. So the bugs don't like our body temperature. So they're gonna go. Um, they don't, there's no cross-contamination. We bathed those chickens in malathion way back when. So there you go, you don't do that these days. The easiest way to get rid of bugs is you clean out your whole coop, okay? And you get a little bit of this stuff, diatomaceous earth, do many of you know about diatomaceous earth? One person, okay. Um, dia, D-I-A, tome, T-O-M, A-C-E-O-U-S, diatomaceous earth. You can even say D-E, food grade D-E. This is wonderful stuff. It's all natural, comes from the diatones in the ocean. They're ground up to a fine powder. And if Hedwig were to ever get bugs, what I would do is where she does her dust baths, I would take a cup of this and I put it in the, the dust bath, stir it up, I'd clean out the coop, I'd put a bunch of this in a, a shaker like a Parmesan cheese shaker, and I'd shake it all over. I'd wear a mask, but I caution you always follow the labels, okay? But I would wear a mask because you don't want to breathe it in. That's the one thing you do not want to breathe this stuff in. So I'd wear a mask, I'd sprinkle it all over and I'd whisk it around, whisk it all over that little coop, and then I'd put in fresh bedding and that will take care of the bugs just like that. And she'll go dust bathe and, and kill. What it does is it cuts up the exoskeletons of the little bugs. <laughs> it's kind of like a bad dream. It's a little, like a nightmare. But that will help. Diatomaceous earth is a wonderful thing. It's all natural, so you can use it anywhere. You can even use it in your house. There's food grade, and then there's sometimes there's, it contains a little bit of, uh, if it's not food grade, it'll contain a little bit of um, other stuff. But what I do is I keep that uh, shaker around and I don't, do any of you have problems with those teeny tiny ants? Okay, yeah, big time, this is great. So you put it in that shaker and you shake it all along the base of your, your foundation of your house and then I whisk it back into the foundation and I don't have any ant problems in the summertime. I do it in the garage, I do it anywhere I have ants. Now, if it rains or something like that, then I have to do it again. But it takes, it definitely takes care of all the icky bugs like that. Okay? Cool. Fun fact for the day. So, um, uh, Chicken Jim, I think out in Parma, he does this sort of thing. That's a smudge pot and he puts dry airy dirt or sand in there so the girls can jump in and dust bathe. Remember I told you there are two really important things for keeping chickens. One is having a good roost so that they can drop. If you find them in the nest box at night, you pull them out of the nest box and you put them back on the roost. And the other thing is some place where they can have a bath where they can bathe themselves. And it sounds counterintuitive um, that they have this dirt or this dust, but they roll around in it and then they come out and they shake out. The oils on their feathers grab the dust and dirt and then when they shake off, it takes it all off. And, it, and that's how they clean themselves. Here, it's what Hedwig's doing right now. There's Hedwig, sweet little girl. And sometimes they look like they're dead. <laughs> But uh, they just roll around in it. And this is under a big tree, so you have to have a spot for them. I didn't have to make one for her. She made her own. Okay, a little bit about my project. This is Alpha Company. That's Peep the Curious. That's, um, remember I told you we painted our house? Yeah, that's house paint right there and there. <laughs> so Peep, Thelma, and Louise. And they're standing on our hot tub looking into our kitchen. Oh yeah, they're very curious. There, see, still on the hot tub, looking into the kitchen. That's in the winter time. You see the Christmas cactus right there. Um, this is Bravo Company, and I wanted to show you this picture. This was the second second group I got. This is um, that's an Americana. You saw Hedwig is is a cream color, right? Americanas can be all different colors, and they have little feathers that come out of their cheeks, and they're so cute. So she's she looks like a hawk. And then this one is a Moran. I had to have a chicken that laid one of those dark brown eggs, right? You get, you get into it and you go, oh, I gotta have one of those, you know? I gotta have, that's why that list of chickens back there is a good list for y'all to have. Now remember, that list differs from the list at the DMB down um, uh, in Garden City, right, on Glenwood. 
and it differs from all the, the five DMBs here in the valley. So you can get different, you call around, you can get different chicks all over the valley. Um, that right there, oh, I'll, there's, the, there's the salmon faverol, the one with the three toes I told you about. And then this one, love this chicken. And I got so excited because I was at DMV, hmm, was it a week ago or a week and a half ago? And they had babies, buckeyes. It's a buckeye chicken. And the, the neat thing about the buckeye is, you know, most of the chickens, remember right off the top, I said we keep chickens for um, natural pest control, right? Mm -hmm. That buckeye will go after a mouse before it goes after a bug. Wow. Yeah, natural mouser. <laughs> Don't need a cat. <laughs> I got my buckeye, and they'll eat it too. <laughs> Nearly a hundred years ago, our federal government was telling us to keep chickens and raise hands, raise hands and keep chickens. It was that uh, chicken in every pot program, right? Campaign. Now, people have to fight for the right to keep them. This is Dorothy Proctor and Berta, and uh, she lives in Sonoma County. And she had an old dog that had passed away, and all of a sudden, these feral chickens started to come around. And she thought they were so cute, so she started feeding them. And word got out, and more chickens started to come around, and three of them showed up, and they all looked the same, tick, tack, and toe. <laughs> she named them. And so she was really kind of digging it. She'd make them a little place to live, you know, and all that. And one day she got home, and there was a note on her door. It said, you got to get rid of your chickens. Signed, Sonoma County. Yeah, and she was, she, it, it really it affected her. She had really grown attached to these chickens. And so she asked for an extension. In fact, she asked for several extensions and got her so-called ducks in a row and got all her neighbors to rally behind her, went to Sonoma County, fought it, and won. And so now they keep chickens in Sonoma County. And Tack is still alive. 12-year-old chicken just hatched out babies last year, three of them. Yeah, 12 years old. Oh, by the way, <laughs> two things. Chickens can live to about 15, kind of like a dog. And you might want to think about an end game, okay? What are you going to do with your chickens? They'll lay every day pretty much through three years. Hedwig is five, uh, four years old now. And she's, if, yeah, it's a long story. I'm going to write for Mother Earth News about making your chicken feel wanted. She, chickens will go like this sometimes and kind of get down on the ground like this. And you think, oh, they want me to pet them. They think you're the rooster. That's why. Oh, and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so cute. People say, oh, my chicken will come up and then she'll get down like this and she wants to be petted. I said, no, she doesn't want to be petted. <laughs> so, so Hedwig does that. And so I started doing this to her, you know, fluffing her up and feeling under her feathers a little bit and checking for mites, right? And all of a sudden, she starts laying more eggs. I, you know, every day, it's like clockwork. And she's a four-year-old hen, going on five. So I have, I, it's anecdotal, but I'm thinking, if she feels the love, she's going to lay the egg, you know? <laughs> and, a, and a lot of old-time farmers will tell you, if you keep um, a rooster around, the chickens will lay more eggs. And so I do have a little pinup in my coop. <laughs> and I don't know if you can see it, in that, but there's a little, there's a really fancy rooster on, on the inside. Okay, so, and, and by the way, I'm a humor writer. I write for a newspaper out in uh, Eagle and, and Middleton and Star. And so the funnier stories are what get me. This is an uh, omelet right here. Britton and Cassie Kaufman. And in Greeley, Colorado, you could have chickens right over on this side of the fence, but not on this side of the fence. So they went to fight for their right in Greeley, Colorado, and they had several he hearings. And Britton and Cassie ran a little blog on the whole thing, online blog. And the last hearing, some woman stands up, this woman stands up and she says, we can't have backyard chickens because then we'll have backyard chicken coops. And she says, I have a friend who's a drug dealer and he keeps his drugs in the coop. <laughs> and Britton and Cassie were like, <laughs> wow. how does that, I mean, what do you do? What do you say to that? And didn't she just get herself in trouble? Um, so the next day on their blog, that shows up. Your drugs go here. <laughs> so those are the stories that you'll find. Those are the kind of stories you'll find in the backyard chicken fight. So state birds, blue hand chicken in Delaware, learn something new today. And of course, Rhode Island red for Rhode Island, right? Um, 
definitely have uh, dogs and chickens together. Harley really protects these girls. I think he had something for um, Thelma in a big way. <laughs> okay, do we have time for a real quick, quick, quick story? Ah, okay, I'm over time, but I'll, I'll tell this really quick. So, I was cleaning the back, backyard, cleaning off the patio because there was poop, and I had the blower going, and I turned it off, and everything was really quiet. I thought, this is odd. And so I go around the corner, and there's Thelma, and Harley has Thelma in his mouth. And I freak out. So I go running over, and I, I, I uh, scolded Harley, and I grabbed Thelma, and I picked her up. And, you're okay. You're okay. Wait a minute. Your wings weren't flapping, and <laughs> your heart isn't even racing. What's the deal here? And then the photos came back from the photo shoot, and we went, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> So, here we go. Yes, you too can raise chickens, research your own situation, gather information, and you are, yay. Formulate a plan, go for it. I'm on Facebook. Let me do this real quickly. I want a photo of you guys. Now, if you're in the victim witness protection program, <laughs> just cover your face, okay? But I'll put you on the backyard chicken fight. Okay, and I, I, I know it's early, but I want you all to mm -hmm. Okay, so, okay, on three I want you to say, we better do it this way. How did you know? <laughs> Have you been to my class before? Okay, but I not only, I want chickens, okay, on three. One, two, three. Chickens. Oh, that was pathetic. <laughs> Where were the hands and the jazz hands, okay? One, two, three, chickens. Okay, got it. Awesome. Okay, I'll put that on um, Facebook. And just so you know, here's my pitch, of course. <laughs> I wouldn't be an author if I didn't pitch you. 20 money-saving tips, helpful diagrams, chicken DIY, the, you know, the, the can with the heater, yeah. Best damn nocturnal predator deterrent ever, page 40, okay? And um, laugh out loud funny, and I give a money-back guarantee. If you don't laugh or you don't um, learn something new from the book, I'll, buy, I'll personally buy it back from you, okay? $12.95 plus tax right here at DMB Supply, and I thank you all. Hey, thank you.